Hi everyone, uh, before we begin, I want to start off with a short uh, movie. This model's not accurate enough. We need to go deeper. Models work with test data in the sandbox, but it's only when we try to integrate the real data on the production cluster that we realize that something is not right. Think about it. How did we get Well, I started fitting the model. Did you spend two weeks cleaning it? Did you have to pay a vendor to hydrate it? Did you have to blackmail a VP to run a V lookup? You're right. This must be test data. We're in the sandbox? Why don't all the data scientists try to escape? In the sandbox, your data is clean. You have a GPU all to yourself, and your model accuracy is perfect. It's easier to just let yourself be deceived. It's called Hyception. Okay, so uh, who can relate? Let me see a quick show of hands. Okay, so not a lot, but some people can relate, which is good. Uh, so yeah, when we work in a development environment or a sandbox environment, Usually things go pretty smoothly. We know our data, everything is clean, sterile, controllable. The problems usually start when our model is faced with real data or when we are uh, deployed in production. So what can we do? What if there was some way that we can uh, make this uh, transfer a bit less traumatic, right? So. The good news is that there are some things that we can do, and I'm going to talk about some of them today. So, uh, I'm Yotam, I'm a software engineer at uh, PayPal. I've been developing automation solutions and tools uh, in Python for the last uh, four plus years, uh, currently in the cybersecurity domain. And I'm also very passionate about data science and machine learning, um, and specifically the intersection between machine learning and cybersecurity. So adversarial examples, uh, data poisoning attacks, uh, lots of cool stuff. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Today I want to talk to you about data validation. Uh, why is it so important and how we can, can we actually implement it as part of our uh, machine learning pipeline. So uh, first let's understand the problem. So why do we need data validation? I argue that we should validate our data in the same manner that we validate our code. And uh, I, I'm guessing that you agree since you're here, or at least I'm hoping that you will agree with me by the end of this talk. Um, so data errors can lead to uh, first bad predictions. Those predictions can lead to bad business decisions that are based on those predictions. And it can lead to a huge time waste. Uh, the time that it takes us to identify that we have an issue with our data and uh, to be able to identify it and fix it is time that will be better spent in higher level thinking, uh, expanding the functionality of our model or dealing with other uh, project or projects or tasks. So that is why, but what do we check for? So uh, it turns out that there are several dimensions to data quality. Uh, that's not an, an inclusive list, but these are some of the things that uh, the research indicate. So data has to be valid. When I say valid, I basically mean it has to have uh, the proper syntax uh, or format. For example, if I have a timestamp and I expect it to be in a certain uh, format, I need to make sure that that is indeed the case. Uh, data has to be accurate, which means that it's supposed to be representative of the real world. It has to be complete. Uh, I'll give an example for completeness. One of the models, uh, the products that, that we were developing in the security product center at PayPal had to detect malicious behaviors best based on a system called traces. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term without going into too much detail, uh, basically every operation that you perform in the operating system is being translated into a certain set of uh, system calls. Uh, it can be opening a file, running a process, uh, whatever. And our aim was to be able to detect certain patterns 
of those system calls that indicate uh, malicious behavior. It could be a malware running in the system, uh, someone trying to exfiltrate data, etc. So we build a model, uh, tested it, everything seems to be working okay, and we decided to deploy it in production. It's only when we started getting data back from the production environment that we saw that we have holes in our data. So there were complete uh, entire chunks of data that were missing. So we could make our predictions, but the question is, is how reliable those predictions are. And obviously there are events that we were missing because we didn't have complete data. Uh, so obviously this issue was uh, identified and fixed, but it still uh, took a lot of time. Uh, so that's uh, completeness, that also has to be consistent, uniform, or at least adhere to some distribution that we expect it to adhere to. Uh, and it has to be unique, meaning we don't expect to see any uh, duplications in our data. And the issue is that this is a problem that is relevant for everyone. Okay, we all know this scenario, we work on a model or a feature, uh, can be several months of work, uh, we tune it, um, tweak it until we are satisfied with the results, and at this point we might decide, okay, it's time to move to production. At that point, basically there are four scenarios that can happen. The first one is that everything is perfect. Okay, we deploy our model, everything seems great because it is great, we get the predictions that we want, and everything is perfect. Uh, the problem is that, as we all know, uh, the world isn't all uh, rainbows and butterflies, and usually that is not the case. Uh, which brings me to the second scenario, which is a bit more realistic, in which, again, we deploy our model, and then, then it could be a matter of a few days, a few weeks go by, a few months, and we start to see a deterioration in our model's performance. Uh, basically, our model gives us some indication that something is wrong. And again, we investigate the issue, hopefully fix it, and the model performance improves. That could be an iterative process till we are satisfied with the result. A more pro pro problematic scenario, which is similar to this one, uh, is one in which, again, we have some kind of a problem with our underlying data, but this time the model doesn't indicate that something is wrong. It takes someone with uh, domain knowledge or domain expertise to look at the data and realize that something is off something doesn't seem right. For example, the, the example I gave before regarding the completeness of the data. Uh, and the worst case, at least in my opinion, is one in which we have a problem with our underlying data, but we are not aware of it, okay? Our, our model is giving us predictions, but our predictions are based on false data. So what can we do? How can we make sure that we don't fall into those third or fourth categories? So that's a great question. I'm glad I asked. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I want to show you some tools today that come to address this issue. But before I do, uh, I just want to point out that for me, the takeaway from this talk is less about the specific tools that we'll see. Uh, it's more about the, the mindset. Okay? So uh, let's... Uh, dive right in. The first tool I want to talk to you about today is called, uh, sorry, Voluptuous. Voluptuous is uh, by far the most popular tool out of the, out of the three that we'll see today. Uh, it's not meant specifically for data frame validation, uh, but it can be used to do that and I'll show you how. So uh, I hope that you can see okay. Uh, I'll just run through the few couple of cells uh, basically, we have some imports and logging, and then we read a sales data set. Let's take a look at the data. So we have uh, several columns, timestamp, CD, store ID, sale number, sale amount, and the associate, which is the person who made the sale. Uh, we can look at the data types of our uh, uh, different features. And now, this is where we start to uh, drill down into uh, the capabilities of Voluptuous. I've created a simple function that takes in a data frame, which field we want to validate. And basically, uh, in order for Voluptuous to be able to uh, process it, we have to transform it into a JSON format. And then uh, just run a scheme, uh, schema on it. And our schema is defined here. Currently, we are, we are only looking at a specific field, which is the sale amount. And we want to make sure that 
uh, our uh, uh, data type is float and the range is between 2 and 1550. So uh, we simply run our function, a validation function, and we see that we get uh, warnings which state that expected a float uh, value, but that wasn't the case. So if you remember, we saw that the data types for the sale is actually int, so that's a mistake. Let's quickly fix that and rerun uh, our validation. Okay, and now we see we have different, re different error reports. So the value must be at least two, uh, and we see that we have a lot of negative, va uh, negative values. Uh, we also get an indication of the amount, total amount of uh, errors in the data frame. Out of 214 samples, 57 are uh, wrong. So let's update our uh, schema. Um, and we might look at the data and decide, okay, that might be returned. Someone maybe bought an item, but uh, wanted to return them and we wanted to refund this money. So if I know that the maximum uh, price of an item in my store is 1550 I expect to get uh, at minimum minus 1550 uh, And then we run it again and we see that this time we have less errors. But there are still a few values that are higher than what we expect. And again, there could be multiple reasons. In this case, maybe it's even uh, new products that came into the store. I wasn't aware of it. Um, and I maybe have to uh, update my schema uh, accordingly. Um, or it can be fraud. Someone accessed my uh, data and changed it or something is, is wrong and I need to address it. Uh, another strong capability that uh, Voluptuous has is to create specific validation function. In this case, uh, it's pretty simple uh, function that validates the date format. And we run it, sorry for that, we run it uh, in the same manner, we define our schema. This time I want to look at the timestamp field and I want to validate every item against this validation function. When we run it, we see we don't get any errors, which is good. So this means we have the proper format, but what about the logic? Uh, this time I want to make sure that we don't have uh, dates that are in the future. So I modified the function a bit. Uh, this time I'm uh, looking to see that the current time is smaller than the, the I'm sorry, the, the time in the data frame is smaller than the current time. And again we run it. And we see that the two items uh, have uh, produced errors. So one of them uh, is pretty close in the future and one is 2050, it's like uh, 30 years uh, in the future. So again, there could be several uh, contrib contributing factors to these errors, but we need to decide and see whether maybe it's a, a sale that, a pre-sale that we entered into the system, but the payment won't be received until 2019. But if I see something like 200, 2050, then something is suspicious here. Okay, so that was uh, voluptuous. Again, pretty intuitive uh, use, and uh, we can create our own validators, which is a very strong capability. The second library uh, I want to discuss is called OnGuard. OnGuard basically lets you make assumptions about your data and then uh, test to see whether those assumptions actually hold true. So let's see how it works. Um, again, we have some imports. I'll, I'll use the same data set, so we are, we're already, already familiar with it. Um, for sales, um, with the data types. This time, uh, I want to define what data, data types I expect my uh, data to contain, even after I perform some kind of manipulation on it. So, these are the data types that I want or expect my data to, to contain. And now the, the way that uh, OnGuard works is by uh, decorators. So this one, for example, checks whether the data frame, after I perform some kind of action on it, uh, contains the data types, new data types that I've defined here. Um, and uh, the second uh, decorator basically checks to see whether the shape is none over six. None means I don't care how many rows I have in the data. And six is I expect six feature columns. So uh, I run my function and then the result of the fu this function is being passed on to those uh, decorators and it's uh, being asserted against my expectations. Um, I run the update data types, I get no errors, which is good, which means that uh, it, my expectations were actually correct and I have the correct data types. 
And now let's say that we want to remove some poor quality data. So I'm uh, removing duplicates and dropping NA values. And again, I have some kind of test to make sure that after I perform this action, I get no, uh, no values that are uh, still missing. And again, we run it and we see that we get no assertion. Okay, so now let's say that we want to add some computational uh, columns. So I want to extend my uh, data frame and add the store total and associate total uh, columns, which basically is a group by store ID and uh, by associate and I perform a summation. So again, I, I added, uh, um, I'm performing the same operation, but I added this time I expect to have eight feature columns. And now when I run it, I get an assertion error, which says associate total has the wrong data type. So I expected uh, to get um, a float, right? Let's recheck. Yeah, to get a, um, a float value. And um, th that wasn't the case. So let's simply use pandas to numeric function to, uh, to turn those uh, uh, types into what we expect and then when we run it again we can see that actually uh, this time nothing uh, the, the assertion passes and we can see that the new data types is exactly as we, as we expected. Okay so another constraint that we have we saw earlier that we expect our data to be between minus 1550 and plus uh, 1550 so we need we can check for that also and if we run it uh, again, it fails. We know it should fail because we saw it earlier. The, the output here isn't the best. I'm aware of that. And then we can see the actual, uh, the actual um, rows in which we had problems. So again, this is uh, our manual work to make sure whether those uh, errors are because of the data. Maybe our scheme isn't flexible enough when we need to update it. Or maybe, for example, if I see this row, then I, I realize that maybe there is something uh, way off here. Um, okay, so that was uh, on guard. And the third and last library that I want to talk to you about today is called TDDA. So by now you must be thinking to yourself, okay, that's cool. But what if there was some way to make this process a bit more automatic? Uh, it's a lot of manual work. So TDDA, TDDA comes to address exactly this issue. Who here has heard about uh, TDD or test driven development? Okay, so most of you have. For those of you who are not familiar, it's a development methodology which states that you should write a test before you even write a single line of code. You make that test, uh, that test obviously fails because you have no code to support it. And then you write the minimum amount of code to make that test pass and you repeat this process for every functionality that you, that you want to add. So TDDA basically takes those principles of TDD and applies them uh, to data. Uh, to data. Uh, so it's test-driven uh, uh, data analysis <coughs> and the library um, basically uh, lets you, this time I'm using a, a different uh, uh, data set. Uh, we can look at it, okay, so we have timestamp, temperature, heart rate, uh, some kind of unique identifier, etc. Uh, and the strength of this library, again, it's the automatic process. Okay, we just run discover constraints on the data frame. And we get a constraints object. And if we want to uh, write it to a file and see what it contains, so we have some kind of uh, metadata. And for every field, we get a specification according to the data that was in the data frame uh, of what to expect. So for example, the timestamp, minimum length and maximum length are identical, which is good because it's the same format. Uh, no null values, no duplicates. Uh, username is a string between three and 21 chars. Again, this is based on the data that we provided. We can fix it manually, we can expand the data set and have it con uh, discover the constraints in itself, etc. Uh, for temperature, we see that it, it uh, understands that the sign has to be positive. I'm not sure that is the case that we want to represent, but that was the data that was given to, him, uh, to it. Uh, and uh, several, several other features. Something interesting to also n note is that if we have categorical data, it automatically uh, infers the different categories in the data. Okay, so we have the constraints. What, how can we use it? So imagine now we're getting a new data frame from, from our production environment. We want to verify against uh, these constraints. So we, we simply read the new data frame um, and run verify data frame. 
again, very simple uh, use. We can see the number of passed tests, the number of failed tests, and we can even get a nice little uh, output which indicates exactly what, which of the constraints have failed and which have passed. Uh, so we can see, for example, that the no duplicates for the build uh, uh, feature uh, didn't pass and the maximum nulls, uh, the maximum value for temperature, etc. And okay, so, but what if we want to see exactly where did we fail? So that's also possible. Uh, there's another option to see the same output but in a data frame format. So how many failures, how many passes for each uh, test or for each feature and uh, a detailed example. None means that this specific example doesn't, uh, isn't relevant for that specific field. And we can see, as I said, uh, by running detect df, the exact uh, uh, rows that actually failed. And again, this is the phase when it comes to us to make the decision on what to do uh, regarding those errors, but at least we know that we have errors, so we can address them. Um, okay, so, well, so that was TDDA. So I quickly showed you really simple use cases of those three libraries, but Again, like I said earlier, what I want you to take out of this talk is less about the specific tools because there are only three out of a lot more tools that are out there for data validation for different <laughs> formats. It can be JSON, data frame, uh, whatever. Um, if you want to check one of them out, I, I encourage you to check out Great Expectations. Uh, it's a great project uh, re becoming really popular lately. Um, and again, what I want you to take out of this talk is less about the specific tools. It's more, more about the mindset and the understanding that, that just by applying those principles, you could, for one, uh, it makes handoff of projects much easier because if you give a new data science uh, your uh, code, it has these uh, data unit tests to describe exactly what are your expectations from your data. Uh, it can also make the detection of errors a lot more uh, quick and accurate. As soon as something fails, you'll instantly know it. Uh, there is, again, th these are really simple use cases, but you can extend it any way you like. And the most important thing, it gets you to think about your data. Uh, it, gets you, it gets you to know your data better, better because it forces you to think about the constraints and expectations that you have from your data. Uh, and that, for me, is the most important uh, part of this process. Um, so, um, a quick shout out to a great course on Safari Books Online by Catherine Germont, which uh, was uh, partially inspired me to, to give this talk. And um, I want to finish up with a quote, uh, quality is never an accident, it's always the result of intelligent effort. Uh, so I hope that by now you understood or I managed to convince you about the importance of data validation and that you leave this room and start implementing it as part of your machine learning pipeline. Thank you. Time for questions. Uh, I'll just say before people I see starting to leave, the, the notebooks are available on my GitHub account, the, the link down there. So feel free to download them and uh, play around with the code. Uh, it's a pleasure, yeah. Okay, in some this table. So uh, the question was uh, whether in our industry uh, is, the, is there some kind of standards uh, for writing uh, uh, correct tests for data or yeah. Algorithm. Or algorithm. So, as far as I know, the, there isn't something uh, uh, unified. There are several best practices guidelines that are scattered, but I'm not familiar with something uh, unified or, for, or formal. Uh, and that's again, that's our responsibility because uh, it's not. It's always the, the the part that we don't want to deal with uh, because it's it's not sexy. It's not fun. But it's important, and it can uh, it can cause us to detect issues early on down the line and save a lot of trouble and time and effort uh, further down the line. Yeah. Yep. If you receive a bunch of data, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of data, how, how much time will it take you to to parse of all the data and generate a, a TDD uh, document? Okay, so so for the for the TDD, ah, you, um, I haven't tested it at scale actually, uh, but it it's it shouldn't be uh, too time extensive. I don't want to throw a number out there because I only tested it 
with small amounts of data, uh, relatively small, but for example, 150,000 lines, it takes seconds, so less than seconds. Uh, so that is what I can tell you, but, but it shouldn't be uh, too extensive. Uh, the library is really well implemented. Yeah. Okay, so the question was regarding the distribution of the data. Is there some way to test that, test for that? So um, actually, uh, Voluptuous has a decorator which is called NSTD, which, is, which sets for the number of standard deviation that the current data has from whatever you define. Um, and, and the other libraries, again, uh, less TDDA, but on Guard, for example, you can implement your own functionality for, for the validation. And then you can, the, the sky's the limit, basically. Okay, thanks.